Lung cancer, which I'm going to be talking about today, is the commonest cause of cancer deaths in the UK. And most people, I'm afraid, with diagnosed with lung cancer today will be dead within a year. This is in very, very stark contrast to what I've been talking about in the three talks previously. So in the last three talks about prostate cancer, breast cancer, and some of the infectious cancers, I was talking about cancers which can either be almost entirely prevented by vaccination, for example, or where treatment is very good. So for most of those cancers, mortality is uh, less than 20%, even uh, well, around 20%, or coming around those, that, that period, even at 10 years. So most people will make a full recovery and live a full life. Lung cancer, unfortunately, is an exception. And the remarkable progress that we've seen in treating other cancers has been a lot slower in lung cancer, although I want to be clear that progress is happening, so it's not that there is no progress, but it has been relatively slow. And what makes this a double tragedy is that this is a cancer entirely for profit. Almost all the people who get this cancer, not absolutely all, as I'll come on to, have uh, got uh, the cancer because an extremely wealthy, incredibly sophisticated marketing industry, the cigarette industry, has got them addicted to cigarettes at a young age and has kept them addicted to cigarettes for the rest of their lives, and then they die. So this should never be a cancer blamed on individuals. This is a cancer created by industry for profit. The other reasons for this cancer Obviously, the, some are just the natural biology, but that's pretty rare. Uh, some is the byproduct of air pollution, and there are uh, some important, and we'll come on to this at the end, industrial uh, cancers, in particular mesothelioma. Now, since this is basically a disease of smoking, I'm going to talk a lot about smoking today. The last two talks have been largely about treatment because it was these are cancers like prostate where there really is very little we can do to prevent. There is a lot we can do to treat. Here it's reversed. Here the issue is we can do things for treatment, and we'll come on to that halfway through the talk, but there is a lot we can do to prevent. And since the epidemiology of lung cancer is the epidemiology of smoking, that will be the first part of my talk. But to stress, there have been substantial improvements in some of the rarer forms of lung cancer, and many people, including people you or I, certainly I know, are living good lives with lung cancer, so it's not that this is a situation for all situations. It is undoubtedly the case, as we'll come on to, that early diagnosis of cancer would be transformative, because like many cancers, if you pick it up early, the treatment is much more straightforward, and the prospects are a lot, are a lot better. The big field I talked about in the first of these talks in this series on uh, infections, but then on immunotherapy, using the body's own immune system to attack cancer, is moving very fast, and lung cancer is one of the areas it is moving fastest, and I'll talk about that briefly. Uh, and the asbestos epidemic, which drives some lung cancer and this other disease, uh, mesothelioma, is reaching its peak in this year of 2020, at least here in the UK. So there are things to be positive about, but to be clear, this is the biggest killer by some distance, and it is largely unnecessary. So lung cancer in both men and women here in the UK, and this would be true in most industrialized countries, is the second most common cancer. Uh, in men, prostate is more common. In women, breast cancer is more common, which I talked about in the last two talks. But because lung cancer uh, is much less easy to treat, it is by some distance in both men and women the commonest cause of people dying of cancer. And around a fifth of all cancer deaths in the UK are caused by this one group of cancers. So this is not a trivial issue. This is a very major uh, public health issue. And what we know really clearly is that smoking is the driver of this. So if people do not smoke, never smokers will have this is, these are Swiss data, but this will be true in many other places. On the right, we'll have maybe a two, less than 2% lifetime chance of getting this cancer. Whereas current smokers, 
uh, the cumulative lifetime risk uh, will be around 15% for men, slightly less uh, for women. If people have stopped smoking, their risk is between those two. It is never, to be clear, too late to stop smoking. Even for people who have lung cancer, it will actually improve their outcomes. Now, after smoking, which is the, by far the biggest issue, uh, the second risk is age. Uh, and if you look at the age profile here, where I'm demonstrating in the middle of this graph, is around about 50. So lung cancer is actually very rare before 50, very rare before 50, and pretty rare uh, before 60. The big peak is in people's 60s and 70s in general. Now, how do we know that uh, lung cancer is caused by smoking? Well, there are multiple forms of evidence. They're all absolutely overwhelming. They all add up. There is absolutely no doubt about this association. It is completely clear. The simplest data are simply to look at smoking cigarettes, and we're talking about cigarette smoking here primarily because that cigarette smoke is taken into the lungs in a way that the old-fashioned pipe and cigar smoke generally was not. So that's it's a cigarette driven problem. And this is the, is the US data on the number of cigarettes smoked. And here, lung cancer, an almost invisible disease before the cigarettes uh, industry got hold, tracking it 20 to 30 years later. And then when the smoking uh, epidemic began to peak 20 to 30 years later, the epidemic of lung cancer begins to peak as well. So that's the first line of straightforward evidence. The second line of evidence is uh, an epidemiological method called case control studies. And that is where scientists and researchers took people who did have cancer, lung cancer, people who did not have lung cancer, and they had just said to them, did you smoke, and if so, how much? And they demonstrated that the people who had lung cancer smoked much more than the people who did not have lung cancer. But the most convincing evidence was from a type of study called a cohort study. And the cohort study, it took a group of people who smoked not at all, a group of people who smoked a bit, and a group of people who smoked a lot, and they followed them over time. And the group that was chosen in the UK, this is a very famous study, uh, was 34, just over 34,000 UK doctors. And they volunteered for this. And within four years, it was really clear what was going on. In the non-smokers, almost no lung cancer. In the moderate smokers, a fair degree of lung cancer, and in the heavy smokers, current heavy smokers, very substantial rates. So put all of these together, it's an extremely clear picture. And this has been replicated over many years in both men and women. Not smoking means you're very unlikely to get lung, very unlikely to get lung cancer, and the amount you smoke is very heavily predictive. Despite that, for quite a long period of time, uh, the uh, cigarette industry implied that it was good for health. This one, for example, is advertising for your throat's sake. It took a very long time to convince the medical profession, let alone the wider public, that this absolutely clear association was true. So if you remember, the data I showed you were from the, the mid-50s and earlier. In a, in a poll organized by the American Cancer Society in 1960, this is half a decade later, only a third of US doctors agreed that cigarette smoking should be considered a major cause of lung cancer. So there was really quite a job of work to persuade even medical scientists that this association was true. And of course, the cigarette industry did everything it could to muddy the evidence. I'll come on to this. Most of what the tobacco industry tried to do, because their own scientists told them this was true, and internal documents that have turned up in court cases since then have demonstrated they knew this in advance of anybody else, was to try and make sure this science was labeled as speculative, uncertain, no one really knows, science produces different answers, all the kind of things you sometimes hear in other areas of science now. And when you hear that, sometimes it's true. And sometimes, as here, it was because there was a concerted attempt to try and make something appear speculative when it was clear that it was, in fact, uh, very clear. And the thing which uh, in the US really turned the tide was a report by the US Surgeon General, a post that's got some similarities to a post that I hold, uh, in a report called Smoking and Health in 1964. 
And that really was the point when the medical profession finally accepted that this association could not be ignored and it was overwhelming. Lots of studies have gone on since then and what all of them have shown is the amount you smoke determines how much lung cancer you have. But if you stop smoking, then actually the risk of lung cancer goes down at every decade. So if people stop in their uh, 60s, uh, then um, uh, 50s, 40s, or 30s, the risks are 10%, 6%, 3%, and 2%, i.e. the earlier people stop, the less likely it is they're going to go on to get cancer. So stop early is good, stop late is good, but not quite as good. There was then a systematic, coordinated, and extremely sophisticated attack on science by the cigarette industry. I have no doubt that many good men and women left the cigarette industry at that stage deciding that they did not wish to spend the rest of their life killing their fellow citizens. Those who were left decided that they were going to undermine the science at every turn and use junk science and the law courts to try and undermine any attack on their ability to make a profit out of killing their fellow citizens. And that is what they did. And uh, I can give multiple examples of this, and they've all come out uh, of court cases where they've had to reveal their own internal documents. This is not speculation. These are accepted court documents, things there was a sustained attack on science, and it continues. Here, for example, is a quotation from the World Health Organization, which is, un which is under constant attack from the cigarette industry, uh, usually covert. Initially, the attempts were to undermine data showing that smoking caused lung cancer. Then there was a sustained attempt to undermine uh, data showing that second-hand cigarettes, where if I smoke, I make it more likely you will get lung cancer, were true. The data were very convincing. Uh, and then every time there's been an advance in public health, the, public, the cigarette industry will try and undermine the science behind that. It's a completely consistent pattern, and it continues to this day. Now, the, uh, this is not to say that the cigarette industry is anti-science. The cigarette industry has some superb scientists uh, in the sense of good at science, uh, not necessarily, I'm uh, not saying anything about their morals one way or the other, uh, working for them, including very, very sophisticated social scientists. And importantly, they worked out what was the right message to make sure that people did not give up on this incredibly dangerous product that was likely to give them lung cancer and a bunch of other diseases uh, will come on to. And what they found was it was no longer possible for them to make the case that these were harmless to health. People basically accepted these were bad for health. But most people believed that the risks would not apply to them, and in particular, they believed that they would not become addicted. Because the basic model for the cigarette industry is get very young people, ideally children, if not teenagers, and if not teenagers, young adults, addict them early, and when, what they'll find is that they can't come off the cigarettes and then they're with them as unwilling customers for life. Because remember, most people who smoke wish they did not. Most people, 70% in this country. And what they found was the desire to quit and actually carrying it out are two quite different things. Because nicotine, one of the components of cigarette industry, cigarettes, is incredibly addictive if people use it for more than a few weeks. And this is more so, actually, in younger people for a variety of reasons. Uh, despite this, the cigarette industry, and I've used relatively old examples here, but they, go, they went right up until there was a ban on them, used incredibly sophisticated market segmentation. If you wish to, measure, if you wish to have an object lesson in how you segment a market in perfect ways using exactly the same product, which is basically dried leaf rolled in, in, in paper that will kill you, it's not a great sales prospect, uh, but they managed and they had an advertising strategy for women who were independent, and another one for women who uh, wanted to stay at home, and another one for men who thought they were macho, and another one for men who thought they were clever, and so on. And they would target every single brand and every single advertisement in a market segment, so everybody had a cigarette and an advertising strategy for them. Often implying, initially, that it was doctors and nurses who were pushing this, that it was very, very healthy. If you wanted to be sporting and not fat and slothful, then you should smoke. And of course, always happy, ending with a happy ending. 
and pushing the message, which they still push, you're always in control. They always push that message, and it is a complete lie. The reality is that 70% of smokers want to quit, but cannot. So never, ever blame individual people with lung cancer or other smoking-related diseases for what they have. One of the wealthiest industries in the world has deliberately addicted to them to one of the most addictive products and kept them there until they die. And of course, lung cancer is not the only thing that smoking does, although that's the cause, that's the thing I wanted to talk about today. It also causes heart disease, stroke, dementia, multiple skin problems, impotence in men, gangrene, people having legs amputated, and all these other cancers as well, for starters. Smoking, I can say with some confidence, is not good for you. Sadly, the cigarette industry uh, targeted children and teenagers, initially covert overtly, and then covertly. So in the days before it became unacceptable to, they were completely straightforward about it. School days are here, and that means big tobacco business for somebody. Let's get it. That's R.J. Reynolds. Uh, the base of our business is the high school uh, student. Uh, another cigarette uh, um, uh, company. Since it became clear these were dangerous, they have had a consistent policy of deploring in public, but in reality undermining measures to stop children smoking. Consistent. Very, very long efforts. And some of their advertising has certainly looked as if it was aimed at children. For example, the Joe Camel ad system uh, claimed to have nothing to do with children, but whilst it was running, this cartoon thing, this may be aimed at mid and middle-aged people, but there again it may not, uh, moved, joke, the, the, this uh, brand moved from 1% to 33%, just under 3, 33% of the underage market. You can draw your own conclusions as to whether this was aimed at children. But the industry continued to, pos to position itself as a partner of things like UNICEF, which is the UN children's uh, body. So I think when companies say we never check to, uh, target children, you should uh, take that claim with some caution. When I was at school, a very high proportion of my schoolmates smoked, and a lot of the, of the advertising certainly appealed to them, whether or not it was targeted at them. Those rates as uh, various things which the cigarette industry said were not going to lead to any reduction in child smoking, they were only going to be about brand, uh, have actually led to reductions. Nevertheless, we're still at a situation when a significant proportion of children in this country smoke by the age of 15. And they go into it thinking they're in control, that's the message, and they soon find they are not. We should also be really clear that the cigarette industry, which is hugely wealthy, I'll come back to that as well, makes most of its profits from people who are the less wealthy in society. Just a few of the examples. The unemployed are almost two times as likely to smoke as the employed. If people are, have an annual income of less than £10,000 a year, they are almost two times the, prob the probability of smoking as those with an income of over £40,000 a year. And smoking prevalence amongst adults with a serious mental health, illness, mental health problem are even greater in terms of their prevalence. These are the people the industry is making its profits from. And therefore, inevitably, lung cancer is unlike things like breast cancer and prostate cancer, which are essentially evenly distributed across the population. These are heavily concentrated in areas of lower uh, of, of deprivation around the country. And of course, it's not just in the UK. So cigarette companies are increasingly moving into uh, the developing world, uh, and that is the direction of travel. Uh, here, for example, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in terms of proportions, uh, and so on, over time. Now, if you read uh, the very popular press, you might get the impression that the cigarette industry, because it's under sustained attack and everyone, the government's bullying it, uh, is doing really badly and they're in retreat and this problem will be solved. Not true. Uh, the way to tell whether a company is doing well is to read the financial pages. F forget everything else. Just look at the numbers. Follow the money. I've chosen to use data from a company based uh, less than a mile away from here. 
Uh, we are on track, uh, said BAT in their latest annual report, for one of the best financial performances for many years. You might think that they're moving from cigarettes to vaping. Last year they had, the, they moved from 708 billion cigarettes, an increase of almost 4% in the number of cigarettes sold in that year. The number of vaping units was 190, uh, 189 million. The UK High Court has looked at the data and accepts one of the things that people say incredibly cynically, and I, as a public health person, deplore this, but they say, well, at least the cigarette industry contributes through the tax system. Not so. The cigarette industry costs the, the, this society roughly 13.7 billion a year and pays in taxes roughly 10 billion, i.e., they are parasitic on us financially in addition to everything else. And just to give a bit of scale, the profit from this company is over three times the combined amount of money spent by the three biggest research funders for medical research for all research in this country. Just to give you a sense of scale. These are very, very big and successful businesses preying on the poorer people in society. You may have got the impression I don't like this industry. <laughs> you can draw your own conclusions from the data. Over time, smoking prevalence has gone down because of a sustained attempt to try and reduce advertising to stop smoking in public places to reduce uh, a number of the things that made this attractive, which the most recent uh, was plain packaging. But there is still, sadly, far too much. Now, I want to just make a comment on e-cigarettes, because this is an issue that is in the news a lot uh, today, um, uh, and uh, today as in at the moment, um, although today, in fact, in, in particular. Uh, I will say a few things very definitively. First thing is, e-cigarettes, if you're using an e-cigarette to help you get off smoking, good on you, that's a good thing to do. It is really clear that e-cigarettes are much less dangerous than cigarettes. That is, however, setting an incredibly low bar. If you've got something that causes stroke, dementia, heart, heart disease, uh, chronic obstructive airways disease, lung cancer, and all these other things, to say that you've got something that's safer isn't really pushing the boat out, but there is no doubt it is safer. So if that's going to help you move across, a very good thing to use. And a recent trial of NHS patients, so relevant to the UK, uh, there's the good and the bad news in this. The one-year abstinence rate in those who used e-cigarettes was 18%, and those uh, uh, with, who did not use e-cigarettes used everything else uh, was around 10%. The good news, twice as many people quit with e-cigarettes. Good, very good. The bad news, even with e-cigarettes, the majority fail. Nicotine is highly addictive. But I also should balance that by saying e-cigarettes are not harmless, and we know this from quite a lot of individual cases. And therefore, if you do not smoke, do not start to take them up, because they will have health effects. There is a big question mark over the long-term effects, in particular, of some of the flavorings that are in e-cigarettes. We know they are probably safe to eat, but lots of things that are safe to eat are not safe to have into your lungs. And we will not know for many years whether these are dangerous or not. Therefore, if you, can't, if you don't need to, uh, why take what could be a significant risk? The one thing I want to say really clearly about this, though, is e-cigarettes in children. Remember that the marketing model for cigarettes used to be get them young and keep them hooked. It is very important we make sure it is really unattractive for e-cigarette companies to market to children. And they'll always claim they're not, because they know that no one will accept that in society. And the, the question is, are the e-cigarette rates going up? And if for a particular brand, the e-cigarette rates are going up, in children, you can bet your bottom dollar it is being marketed to them, and we will, I'm stating this as an absolute fact, we will move decisively if we see that happening. Because getting children addicted to nicotine is an unacceptable thing to do, uh, even for a legal industry. E-cigarettes are a good thing to get people off cigarettes and help them stay off them. They are a very bad thing to be pushed uh, onto children at a young age. Now, cigarette, cigarette smoking is not the only thing which causes lung cancer, but it is the great majority. Uh, recently, there was the sort of definitive statement that air pollution, in particular particulate matter, so-called PM2.5, possibly PM10, is also a cause of, air, of uh, lung cancer. And indoor air pollution, 
Uh, and that, a lot of that comes from vehicles uh, and other things. So I t gave a talk about air pollution a while ago. Uh, certainly something uh, we need to get on top of for many reasons. Indoor air pollution is an issue of which the biggest cause remains other people's cigarette smoke. Uh, and then there's a natural hazard, something called radon gas, which is a real uh, uh, hazard in particular parts of the world. But the majority is still smoking by some distance. And finally, um, before I start to move on to treatment, uh, two just slides just to make a little bit of a, a biological and then a sociological point. The, the biological point is that there is roughly a 30-year time lag uh, between reductions in smoking and starting to see reductions in mortality. So because smoking in men peaked earlier than in women, but a much higher peak, lung cancer rates have begun to come down in men. In women, there was an aggressive marketing campaign aimed at women specifically, meaning the peak of smoking in women was later, and therefore the peak of lung cancer deaths has also been later. That was a deliberate attempt by the cigarette industry, in, incidentally, well after they knew that these were going to kill people. The sociological point is that different patterns of smoking occur in different societies, and they change over time. In general, in most societies, women smoke a lot less than men, but that varies. In some, it's massively less. In some, uh, it's slightly less. And I've just given a few countries around the world. So that's the cause, the, the cause of lung cancer, our biggest killer by far in terms of cancers. Uh, and I think it's, it's well worth reflecting on that uh, when we look at the next section. So now on to uh, symptoms, our diagnosis, and treatment. Uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately in one sense, but unfortunately in another, the symptoms of lung cancer are very vague and nonspecific until people are really quite advanced in their disease. So once they start, they tend to include persistent cough, cough with blood, being short of breath, having fatigue and weight loss, shoulder and chest pain because of trapping of some nerves or of irritating some nerves, and a variety of specific symptoms. This one here on fingers is something called clubbing. This one here is something called Horner's syndrome. You can see the eyes are different with the eyelids. Uh, the thing with all of these is they often occur quite late in the disease. And that is a major issue. And of course, many of these, like cough, many of you will have at various points. And in particular, if you're a smoker, People expect to be chronic coughers if they're smokers, and that's one of the problems with diagnosing this early. The initial diagnostic tests are usually radiological. You start off with a pulmonary chest X-ray, see the lung cancer here, or a CT scan. Uh, here's the lung cancer in this area here. So you can see it on an ordinary X-ray. And then after that, there's likely to be what's called, uh, what's called a bronchoscopy, uh, not in all cases, but in most, where a small thin tube is pushed down into the lungs to look at the mass and take a biopsy and find out what it is. It's a relatively quick procedure. Usually most people don't remember it. Uh, and uh, that allows people to move to the next stage of what is the right treatment for this person. Now, through all out the talks I've been, have given uh, so far on cancer, I've stressed that there are three different things you need to look at in broad terms in thinking what is the best treatment. The stage, which is to do with the degree of spread, the grade, which is the appearance of the cells, and the type. I'll go through those uh, in the different areas. Each cancer, the relative contribution of these is different. Some, it's much more important about just the stage, sometimes the type uh, matters. And in the case of lung cancer, the really critical ones tend to be stage, how much it's spread, and type, where, which cells it comes from. The stage, if the stage is a low stage, it's a stage one disease, that means it is a very, very small cancer in a localized area. There are a variety of different versions of this, but they all basically mean a small cancer in a localized area that has not spread. The problem, though, is people in stage one and two disease, early disease, tend not to have any symptoms. So most people tend to present later once the cancer has actually spread to other bits of the body. And herein lies uh, many of the problems. So stage two, small or local spread. Uh, stage four, the extreme end, cancer in both lungs or it's spread around the body. And there's a live debate. You could, you should, you know, for other diseases like breast cancer, 
you say, well, the way you deal with this is you screen. You screen women with breast cancer uh, for breast cancer with mammography every three years. Should we be doing this for smokers? Uh, and this is a live question. Uh, and the answer is that the evidence on this is mixed. You pick up cancer earlier, but there isn't yet clear evidence you actually reduce mortality. And we need to look at this quite carefully. So this debate is still going on. And I think it may well resolve itself over the next few years. So that's the stage, how far is it spread? The second thing that's important is the type of lung cancer. And there are several types of lung cancer, but they're broadly divided for practical purposes into two. Something called small cell lung cancer, around 12% of cancers, but it's very aggressive often. It used to be called oat cell cancer, for those of you who trained in medicine a long time ago. And then a group of other uh, cancers called, which are lumped together with a rather uncatchy title of non-small cell lung cancer, which is in fact the majority. Now, the amount of each of these cancers which is caused by smoking varies. In the case of small cell lung, lung cancer, the, almost all of it is smoking related. Whereas for the type adenocarcinoma, which comes from uh, the mucus producing cells, a higher proportion of that is not smoking related. So that could happen even in non-smokers. So the type varies, but the treatment is different between these different types. And if it does spread, uh, it spreads to local lymph nodes, many cancers do that, to the liver, quite common uh, as well, to the bone, to the adrenal glands, this is relatively uh, less important. But importantly, lung cancer, unlike some of the cancers I've talked about so far, has a particular tendency to spread to the brain. And in particular, small cell lung cancer, the very, very highly smoking related one, spreads to the brain very early in the disease, making it a lot harder to treat. Now, I'm just going to take US data here. Uh, and one thing I should say really clearly is the UK does not currently have the best cancer, lung cancer survival rates in the world. In fact, we are some distance behind the market leaders. Uh, we are very good in many other cancers, but this is one where uh, we have things to learn. So I've taken some US data. Um, and uh, first thing to say, in the US, more people die of lung cancer than breast, prostate, and codon combined. Still a big uh, killer. Um, in terms of the two types, small cell cancer here and non-small small cell cancer, if you get localized disease, non-small cell cancer, actually, this is early disease, the majority of people five years later will be alive and well, having had usually surgery, which I'll come on to. Whereas small cell cancer, even if you catch it early, the majority of people will not be alive and well at five years, and obviously in late disease, that's a problem. But the big issue for us is that lung cancer tends to be diagnosed late once it is spread to distant parts of the body and therefore is harder to treat. So what are the treatments? Well, uh, as always, with a solid cancer, the exception to this we'll come on to in the last lecture of this series, uh, surgery remains the best treatment if you've got early localized cancer. You find the cancer, you identify it, you cut it out, there may be some additional treatment, but cutting it out is the key. The cancer is gone. Um, and this continues to develop. It's an old discipline, obviously, surgery, but it continues to develop. And I just wanted to give an example of this. In the last three weeks, this came from The Sun, that well-known uh, medical journal. Uh, and, uh, but it's accurate, uh, to be clear. Uh, and uh, you know, celebrating the fact that the NHS had had its first keyhole surgery, small surgery, for a late-stage lung cancer. So surgery continues to improve. It's not, just, it's not as old-fashioned, I think, as some people uh, fondly imagine, having watched uh, old-fashioned films. Depending on where it is, someone might have a lobe of a lung removed, or they might have a whole lung removed. This uh, person has had a whole lung removed. Uh, and uh, in an early cancer, this may be sufficient just to cure the cancer, with or without other treatment. So who actually has surgery? And these percentages, I think, tell you a story. In people with non-small -small cell cancer, if you've got stage one disease, the majority of people will have cancer, and if it's stage two, pretty close to half, will have surgery. Because it's localized, you can go in, you can take it out. That uh, can be a very major part of, or the whole treatment. Once it's spread, surgery is much less useful. There's no point putting someone through a major surgical operation if actually the majority of the cancer or some of the cancer has gone elsewhere. 
Whereas if you're talking about people with small cell lung cancer, because it spreads incredibly early in the disease, even if it's, uh, if it's localized, only a minority have surgery. And once you get to stage two, basically surgery is hardly used at all. The next thing that you might have is radiotherapy. And radiotherapy, a lot of people worry about this thing is going to make them radioactive and various other things. Radiotherapy is an extremely effective treatment for some people. Um, in non-small cell cancer, the less aggressive form in, in some ways, uh, they may have, people may have it because they're not actually fit enough for surgery. Remember, people who smoke heavily also have heart problems, also have lung problems. A major operation may be something you just think, this person may not get through it. So let's use radiotherapy, which has... Uh, fewer of the problems uh, than surgery for many people. Or it might be after surgery, or it might be to add on to chemotherapy. But this is to cure, or at least to delay. And then in small cell cancer, you tend to use radiotherapy really early on. And in particular, there tends to be a tendency to have to radiate the brain, even if you haven't seen it spread to the brain, because the worry is that some cells have already got there, and therefore, you want to try and kill them before they cause problems. And the final reason you might have this is to get rid of symptoms. If there's bone pain to kill the cancer in a bone, for example, really localized uh, in that area. And it can be given by a variety of methods. It can be external beam where it's shone through someone from lots of angles so that the concentration is in the place where the cancer is. It might be what's called stereotactic, where you, look, you put it very close, uh, uh, or, or there are a variety of other ways of delivering it. So the first thing is surgery, then radiotherapy. And to look at the relative mix of those two, uh, in stage one, two, three, and four, blue is surgery, and green is radiotherapy, and red is both. And in stage one, most people have surgery. Those who don't have radiotherapy, a few have both. Two, a bit radiotherapy starts to creep in a bit more. By the time you get on to stage three and four, radiotherapy becomes a much more important part of treatment. And then there are other ways you can locally uh, destroy cancer cells, usually to deal with symptoms, in fact, and they involve putting a bronchoscope back into the lung and then using either microwaves, pretty similar actually to what you do to heat up a cup of tea, but rather more localized, um, radiotherapy, laser therapy, where you actually shine a laser and burn it, um, diathermy, which is physically burning it using uh, a probe, um, or what's called photodynamic therapy. Photodynamic therapy is when you give a drug which is activated by light. The drug's throughout the body, but it's activated in the area you shine the light at in the lung, and so the drug actually works, but only in the localized area which the light is shone at. So it's a, it's a, it's a very clever development in terms of getting concentration of drug exactly where you want it and not in any other place. So it's a, it's a definite improvement. So surgery, radiotherapy. Third thing is chemotherapy. And to be clear, many people who have lung cancer are treated without chemotherapy. Everyone thinks they're going to have chemotherapy and actually that's not true. I'm not going to go into the chemotherapy in very great detail because I've talked about it in previous lectures and I don't want to repeat myself. The main point about radio chemotherapy is the idea of it is it kills cells that are dividing. Your body is full of cells that are dividing, but the cancer cells are dividing a lot more. That's what makes them a cancer. And so it kills normal cells, and it kills cancer cells, but it kills many more cancer cells, and the normal cells grow back. Now, you will have side effects generally, and they tend to be in bits of the body where the cells are turning over. They're dividing a lot, like the gut, like hair, for example, as most people are aware. So chemotherapy can have very serious side effects, um, but mostly they are temporary. And I think an important point to make about chemotherapy is that many of the drugs in chemotherapy, this kind of blast everything in sight and hope the good things grow back, are very, very old drugs. For example, some of the ones used in lung cancer came out of mustard gas. It was developed for the First World War, uh, others have come from various plants, for example, Pacific U here. So these are relatively old drugs, and they're very toxic drugs. That essentially is their point. But as I say, if you're talking about people with non-small cell lung cancer, most people, in fact, do not have chemotherapy. And people who have an early stage disease, actually it's really a minority 
of people, very small minority, who will have chemotherapy. So cancer does not equal chemotherapy. It's uh, under uh, other cir particular circumstances. Whereas a small cell cancer, because it's spread usually early in disease, you need to have something which will spread through the whole body. Surgery and radiotherapy are much less useful, and therefore it's much more widely used. This is the one that's almost exclusively smoking. Now, improvements in cancer survival have occurred. Uh, on the left here, we have the one-year survival. And on the right here, we have the 10-year survival. Uh, sorry, five, uh, yes, 10-year survival. And they're improving, but relatively slowly. And that is largely because of this late, late diagnosis. So if we could diagnose earlier, the mortality rates would go down really quite a lot. Diagnosis is critical. But there are significant advances in lung cancer treatment occurring uh, on the drug side, and they tend to be for particular specific lung cancers. So what we're basically doing is chipping away at lung cancers so the different types of lung cancer, one by one, we can steadily start to improve the, the, uh, the outcome. And the, broadly, the two groups I'd just like to just highlight, I think it's called targeted therapy. This is not chemotherapy. None of these are chemotherapy. And this is where a particular chemical interferes with a cancer cell and either kills it or stops it uh, working. And immunotherapy, which uses your own immune system, which is very good at killing cancer cells if it's aware that the cancer is there, to wake up the immune system and get it to kill the cancer. Those are two of the biggest areas of improvement, currently for a restricted range of cancers, but uh, they are improving. And I'll give two examples of these. There are many others. I just, these are just ex uh, recent, relatively recent uh, examples. Um, there is, uh, for example, uh, 3 to 5% uh, of people uh, who have um, uh, uh, one of the non-small cell lung cancers have uh, a particular uh, mutation called the anaplastic lymphoma kinase. The actual name of it doesn't matter. Just take it from me. It's a mutation. If you have that one, then there are particular drugs, class of drugs, which can really slow down that cancer or even, in some cases, appear to stop it in its tracks. And so what you'll see is these are people who've been on that drug and these are people who had conventional chemotherapy where this is survival, that's zero and that's 100%. And what you can see is there's a clear survival advantage to these. And for some people, that survival seems to go on for a very long period of time. Too early to tell how it's going to, what's going to happen over the longer term. So drugs like this, these are targeted therapies that are actually interfere with the particular cancer. This is one of the big growth areas for cancer therapy drugs. And the second uh, is immunotherapy, where the, own, the body's immune system is used to kill the that you wake up the immune system by a variety of different methods, or you use the immune you use immune antibodies to attack cancer. And again, what you can see is significant survival advantages. And if people want a, a longer discussion on immunotherapy, I did 25 minutes on it in my first lecture of this series. It's a very important, fastest moving area of cancer treatment at the moment. So that is really what I wanted to talk about in terms of lung cancer. I did, however, just want to add on a section at the end about the most important risk factor for occupational cancer because most of the occupational cancers we have in the UK exhibit themselves through the lung. And the big risks are asbestos, way ahead, the biggest occupational risk for people to get lung cancers or other cancers, silica, which is dust uh, in things like mining, diesel exhaust, paint, and radon. The numbers here are the total numbers of people. So the total numbers are relatively small, but all of these people would not have got the cancer without the work they do. So very important to remove it from the system. But as you can see, by far the biggest is caused by asbestos. And roughly half of those are lung cancers, and roughly half of those are a specific kind of cancer called mesothelioma. It's an almost entirely preventable cancer. 94% uh, of the risk is related to asbestos. So if you don't have asbestos exposure, your chance of getting mesothelioma are incredibly low because it's rare anyway. It's uh, much lower otherwise. Dole, who was the person who showed the smoking was a risk, also showed that this was a risk for lung cancer uh, in the 1950s. 
And then subsequently, a South African group demonstrated there was a clear risk for this disease called mesothelioma. Mesothelioma is not a disease, not a cancer of the lung, but it's a cancer of the lung lining. And what tends to happen is that you get inflammation around the cancer, and that leads to a situation where the lung is gradually, essentially waterlogged because the fluid has come in and people uh, not exactly drown in their own fluids, but it, it pushes their lung right up. Rather like with smoking, the medical profession were quite slow to realize what a threat this was. So 1955, Dole's work, 1960, early 60s, mesothelioma. This is an editorial from The Lancet by a leading medical practitioner of the day. It would be ludicrous to outlaw this valuable and often irreplaceable material as asbestos can save more lives than it can possibly endanger. And this was because it's very useful in preventing fires. The problem basically with asbestos is it was relatively cheap and incredibly versatile. It's, you can use it to strengthen a whole bunch of different things, and it also has the advantage of almost complete heat resistance. It was used extensively in shipbuilding, heat insulation, cement and tiles, electrical insulation, safety curtains and blankets, ropes, brake plaids, artificial snow. You'll all have seen this. That's all asbestos. Uh, obviously for fire, uh, and in kitchens, ironing boards, sheds, and school laboratories. All of you will have handled asbestos if you're older than about 30 years old. And some of you will be living around with it around you. So it was put everywhere because it is so good. Uh, remember, we knew it was going to cause, can cause cancer from the 1950s. The peak of import into the UK was 1973, when 190,000 tonnes were imported into the UK. It was not finally banned until 1999. And there's still a lot of asbestos in the environment which has not yet been properly removed. Asbestos that is completely inert, that's not disturbed, is relatively safe. Once it starts to break down, once it starts to be disturbed, then you get the dust and then people have the risk of this. So this is an entirely uh, preventable form of cancer that we now have got uh, a big problem with. Although it's rare, about uh, just under 3,000 cases a year in the UK, the mortality rate is extremely high, relatively speaking. And the mortality rates have increased by a staggering 887% since the 1970s. This is all industrial. So this is all caused by industry. Uh, survival is not very good, although it tends to be slightly better in people who are younger, un um, unsurprisingly. 2020 is probably the year when this epidemic of mesothelioma and asbestos-associated lung cancer reaches its peak because we banned it in the, 19, the end of the 1990s. So the projected peak is this year, and it will now decline, but quite slowly. And depressingly, more people will be dying of mesothelioma on the day I retire, provided the government does not push out retirement age to a really extraordinary extent, uh, than uh, on the day that I entered medical school. So I've, we've seen this peak go up, and it's been quite uh, depressing uh, to watch. Mesothelioma is highly concentrated, unsurprisingly, in areas of industry that had used a lot of uh, asbestos. So in particular, areas where there was shipbuilding and where people who uh, are in the construction industry tend to live. It's, smoking is a cofactor, so if you smoke and have asbestos exposure, you're more likely to get both of these uh, diseases, and then the partners of asbestos workers, and uh, this will sound sexist to modern ears, but it is just a fact, this generally was wives of asbestos workers, also tended to get this as a result of their partner coming home with asbestos dust in their clothes uh, and it getting into the house. So this is my summary uh, of uh, today's rather bleaker talk. Every other talk so far, this, this, this series has been incredibly optimistic. And let me assure you that the next uh, talks are also going to be optimistic. This is the nadir, but it's a, and the sad thing is that almost all of these cancers are caused by smoking for a very rich industry or industry. Lung cancer is and will remain for many years, and many years, probably the rest of my lifetime, the leading cause of cancer mortality. The great majority is due to smoking, and therefore it is a profit-driven cancer. It is only exists for profit. Using early addiction, 
as the method by which people are got onto this and extraordinarily dishonest advertising. Smoking is falling, and so will lung cancer as night follows day, but with a very long delay. A minority is due to air pollution and occupation, most of which is also preventable. But if we got rid of smoking completely, there would still be some lung cancer. A lot of this would be due to industrial or pollution reasons. It is absolutely essential we improve on early diagnosis, because this is going to be around for the rest of our lifetimes for sure. And if we diagnose early, the prospects for treatment are substantially better. And asbestos is the leading occupational cause of cancer, causing both lung cancer and mesothelioma. Thank you very much.